Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you from K-State Online as we get set for the Sunflower Showdown this week. K-State and KU, game 11 of the year, just two regular season games remaining, and uh, this will be a big one under the lights at KU this weekend. Uh, probably one of the more hyped-up games in recent memory. I guess each one kind of keeps getting more and more. That last year's was kind of to that level, but – some of the gas was taken out of it because KU had started to slip a little bit and how they had played their season. And then you think about some of the like less miles years. The 2019 actually had a bunch of hype going into it. I think K-State people looked at it from a realistic standpoint of you're still not a good football team. And uh, we saw that with the outcome. K-State was up like 38 to three before uh, less miles decided that he needed to call his all of his timeouts to get one of his sons into the end zone, whichever one it was going to be. And there was obviously 2020, which was a lot of fun. If you were a K-Stater, uh, 55 to nothing was a, was a big win there with a couple of punt returns. So there was a lot to uh, kind of take in there with those, but this is certainly the one that you have two teams that are both very good uh, in the way that they are playing right now. Obviously, KU had a tough loss to Texas Tech. They've got questions at quarterback because of injuries and whatever else you want to call it. Uh, but K-State comes into this facing a team that at home can can pro provide a pretty good scare to them uh, if, they're, if they're not ready and not careful when they start this game with KU this week. Does Kansas State have a win over a team better than KU right now? No. Troy... I mean Troy is like the only Troy is like the only good team K State has beaten this season. Yeah, TCU sometimes is okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess Texas Tech. You know, maybe Tech still has a little bit of juice in them. Uh, they yeah. did it when K State played them and everything. When, when, so, and this is not to take anything away from the Kansas State season. They're seven and three. They've played absolutely outstanding football for most of the year. You don't blow everyone out almost on your schedule without being a really, really good football team. But they've essentially lost every time they played a team that is respectable, at at the very least. Now, yeah, and all those games I, have taken place on the road too. And all three have been on the road. Now, I will say, Oklahoma State is more than just respectable. Missouri is more than just respectable, and obviously Texas is more than just respectable. So. They haven't really been played a lot of just – they've either played teams that are below average or bad mm -hmm. or pretty good or great. They haven't really played a lot of teams that are somewhere in the middle or a little above average. I'll give them credit. And that's both of these next two games, KUE and Iowa State. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's kind of the thing about like last year's schedule. Um, K-State played some of those teams that – you would consider to be in the middle ground last year, like Texas and, you know, maybe Baylor a season ago. K State played Baylor when they were six and three last year. Oklahoma State was obviously, they were top 10 when K State played them. Texas Tech won eight uh, last year. Then you had the Tulane and Missouri games in the non con and Oklahoma. Um, and you felt like even Oklahoma, who finished the year at six and six, uh, at least in the regular season, there was still a little bit uh to that team there's just not that in the big 12 this year there's a pretty big divide between the haves and the have not bad. this season good or bad yep yeah. you're good or you are bad or in the case of what i would say just two teams ku and iowa state you're solid there's yeah. only a couple teams that are solid tech is getting closer to there it look tech has i'll say this i'll give texas tech the benefit of the doubt they've had a lot of bad luck this year they the way that that schedule was configured yeah. was conducive to, to failures in the early part of the season. And then they had terrible quarterback luck. So I will say Texas tech poor fortune this year. Yeah. I mean the tech schedule, not a uh, great thing for them in the way it worked out, but we'll see. I, I don't know that you, you can probably take a little bit, but I don't think it means much heading into this game for K state with KU that they've you know not won one of these road games against these better teams um, because I you know I think everybody can look at it and see that K State themselves is a good team. The Oklahoma State one is pretty easy to explain. 
Like that was easily K State's worst performance of the season. And honestly, one of the more surprising and terrible performances that we've seen uh, for a Chris Kleiman team that it felt like everybody was there to contribute. You know, obviously, like 2020 had some decimated roster situations. The 2021 team that had to go to Stillwater and, you know, Skyler had already gotten hurt. Will Howard gets hurt on like the second series of the game and they're having to roll Jaron Lewis out there uh, for like the second half. Like that's a totally different deal. But the, the Oklahoma State game, with everything ready to go and at your disposal, that was the worst that K-State's ever played under Chris Kleiman. I'm convinced of it. And then the other two, you just came up short. The other team beat you by a field goal. You had your chances and you just didn't get the the fortune of either the last the last possession or the last opportunity. So I'm not overly worried about how the trend has been on the road because again, those are two really talented teams. And if yeah. it was for where Mizzou was stationed and how their schedule played out this year, uh, there's a chance that they're a one of the they're a top ten team right now. They may still be with how they play. They just killed Tennessee. Yep. Um, what I would agree with you because it, it, I'll put it this way: Could they have been played? Could they have played better? Yes, but you didn't ab- absolutely, at least exclusively, lose at Missouri or at Texas because you didn't play well. Yeah, like yeah, th- there was a part that those two teams went out and got it a little bit too. Yeah. Now, I do think you lost at Stillwater because you didn't play. Mm, yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's 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 totally fair. And so we'll see. I think this team will come out. They'll be prepared. They'll also be motivated and understand that they've had some issues on the road and want to uh, probably erase that doubt. So we'll talk a little bit more about the K-State KU game uh, here in a moment. But the uh, main goal is to tie the bow on the dominant win over Baylor, 59 to 25, the big win. win for the Cats. Yeah, D.Y. picks up the win, beats me by 34. Um, I think th- I got the big win in Lubbock, but after that, uh, you've had a a good differential on me, so uh, not a not a great outcome this year if we're, we're tracking that. Next year, I guess, what, six road games for K-State? So I might get uh, I might get a little bit of a boost from that. Yeah. But well, the, and I, a little inside – um, inside fastball here, I don't think Kansas State's particularly happy with the way that the Big 12 schedule unfolded in that the future ones because you don't want a year where you only have six home games. Uh, well, look, I I could I could have guessed that when it came out that they kind of got did dirty by the the way the situation ends up going because you would have wanted to have it balanced and say, hey, can you help us out a little bit here, Big 12? And the fact that they didn't like. I get that at some point some concessions had to be made in this scheduling and somebody was ultimately going to be kept unhappy, but it is unfortunate for K-State that it's like, man, you couldn't have looked around and said, we, we see you got the road game at Tulane next year. and Why why can't you help us out? But, you know, it is what it is, and uh, K-State will get over it. And just as long as you win that game at Tulane, it doesn't really matter except to the fans that will be a little bit upset that they only get six home games next season. Yeah, and it's it's just not great for like the community and the, the athletic department because you budget yeah. essentially for at least seven. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, dive into it. Baylor, K State. Before we get to the over unders, uh, what is the general takeaway from how K State played over the weekend and and how it sets them up moving forward? Offensive balance, typical defense where you give up an early score and then settle in the rest of the game. I do like how the last five games they've kind of flipped the script with turnover margin. They're now dominating in the, in that area, <laughs> excuse me, compared to the first five games of the year. First five games of the year, they were starting to drift into, in terms of rankings, the hundreds when it came to turnover margin. Now, because they've flipped that pendulum so um, drastically in the last five games, I think they're now 17th in the country in turnover margin. So you're really doing well in that area. Bad special teams, though. Um, that can get you beat in Lawrence, especially. Yeah. You get, I guess you got the, the hidden Sean Snyder storyline there too. And I guess you, you know, you say what you want, but you don't want to be playing poor special teams and have Sean Snyder there to kind of pick you apart. And, and maybe that's that's part of the calculus here. I mean, Lance Leipold said today's Monday, said on Monday that, you know, he has one of the best speakers ever when talking about this game because he can just have Sean Snyder speak to his team. So they're definitely going to use uh, the former Kansas State coach. 
I, I, I just don't know uh, how if you know I, I, I don't know the Sean Snyder thing is weird in this dynamic on uh, how how can how, like I don't care it's a job for people guys look past it all the time but how can you be a guy that spent that much time and obviously totally. Kansas State is incredibly important to you how can you get up there and and deliver the the right message to the KU side of it like. Uh, you can get up there and talk about how much it means, but shouldn't you're gonna you should feel dirty about the way you're doing it? And this is kind of what I've said all along about the Sean Snyder thing: is whatever. Like if the guy can get himself a job right now, go for it and do it. Um, but it just feels a little dirty, and it feels like uh, when when you've benefited, your family has benefited from peddling the whole family moniker for so long. Uh, you, you're telling me you couldn't have gotten a job anywhere else. Um, it's just a little bit of a, uh, an odd and grimy move by Sean Snyder. And I think that this week will kind of highlight that. Like, I, I don't know how you can go into that and be serious with yourself if you're Sean Snyder and, and really help, uh, with what they're doing there. But Hey, you know what? Good, good for him on making his money and Lance Leipold having him there. It, I, I struggle with this all the time, so I can understand it. There's been guys that have coached at both Ohio state and Michigan. There's been fathers of Ohio State players that their sons went to Michigan and then they were wearing, you know, maize and blue during that game for the three or four years that their kid was there. It's just, it's, it's hard for us to reconcile those thoughts and have them coexist, but these people find a way. Yeah. I, I just, yeah, a, a very odd thing. We'll see. I mean, think, uh, about, think about Colin Sexton works in the KU athletic department. It's another one right now. While yeah. Curry, Curry does NIL for Kansas state. So it's interesting the way how everything goes. Yeah, look, and I, I'm not like it doesn't bother me. It just it, it's one of those weird things to me. It's yeah, like, eh, I don't know. It doesn't I, I, I bother me. It's just hard for me to rationalize how they can do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, I look. I'm never going to be in the position to where they're going to pay me to do something like that. But yeah, that, that's what I'm I, saying. There's maybe, no way that maybe. I, I know that there's no way that I could or would ever do yeah. something like that. We, we, we say we say how it's we have a hard time rationalizing it. Um, how they can do it because we couldn't picture ourselves doing it. But I guess at the end of the day, a, a pretty fat paycheck makes it a lot easier. Yeah. All right. Well, let's roll into the over unders. Take a look at them from this past weekend. Recap the K State win over Baylor this way. We headed into the weekend. Uh, you and I were tied at 28 and 20. Drew was two games back at 26 and 22. Very first one was K State yards per carry at 5.3. Uh, all three of us took the over. We just thought, hey, Baylor, bad run defense. K-State, one of the better running teams in the Big 12. And K-State came out. They threw the ball a little bit more than I anticipated. We talked about this last week, and yep. we're trying to figure out what maybe the split should be. I, I said, I thought, you know, 20 passes maybe should be the target for K-State in this game because I thought that's how easily success on the ground would come. Uh, K-State ended up throwing the ball 29 times with Will Howard in the game they got five more from Avery Johnson so uh the the run game it wasn't as big of an emphasis they still had some success uh DJ Giddens averaged 6.4 yards a carry but as a team they were at 4.9 thanks to uh some sack yardage and then uh guys later in the game not able to to produce a ton on the ground so they weren't able to come through in that department uh what did you make of the run game on Saturday it was fine yeah uh no concerns like I said like you said uh, sack yardage, garbage time. You know, you look at what DJ Gins did, you feel good about it still. Yeah. All right. So that's a uh, big fat 0 1 for all of us to start there. K State sacks. We all three took the over of two and a half. The Cats, they did get their third sack eventually after Cody Stuffel being early in the game, got, uh, got two of them for K State. Colby McAllister gets the last sack of the game of all guys. Um, Look, it, it wasn't necessarily the guys that we would have anticipated being involved there, but more so on the Cody Stuffelbean side. What did that mean for K State to get production out of him when normally the names we're thinking about are Khalid Duke, Brennan Mott, and Nate Matlack? That's good to see Cody Stuffelbean. It feels like they're starting to trust him more and more. His snap counts have kind of been high this year, so I think at least higher than last year. So I think it's somebody that they at least thought that the production was there, even if the stats weren't. Now you have a game where the stats meet the production. I think they're pretty happy with what they're getting from him. Obviously, he gets a little bit more playing time because Khalid Duke knocked out uh, 
with, with uh, you know, Khalid Duke may, wouldn't want to be in a boxing ring for Khalid Duke. <laughs> now, I know from what I've heard, the television didn't show a lot of that. They basically only showed yeah. the Baylor guy with the initial, um, you know, jack of Khalid Duke there with the punch because the Baylor guy, the left tackle, I believe, did start it. But what we can tell you from being there for what was not on television is that Khalid Duke probably got punched two through ten. Yeah. No, he uh, he got he got his licks in there, and uh, the Baylor guy probably regretted uh, getting <laughs> that thing started off. And we'll see. Uh, it'll yeah, be interesting if, if anything comes down for Khalid I, Duke I where he has to miss so. more time. I think it would be out by now if it did, so I don't think so. Yeah. But it was interesting. <laughs> usually, or Two things. Usually these football fights are tend to be pretty even. Mm-hmm. Like they're just, they're just trading blows on each other's helmets and do nothing. Um, this was not an even one. Khalid Duke definitely won this battle. And two, I think he had the wherewithal to rip the guy's helmet off too. Yeah, he, uh, he did not get shortchanged in that fight. So – uh, K State was able to get in there. I thought the pressure was fine. I thought Blake Shapin did a lot of moving out of the pocket in the game. Uh, so again, like they didn't put up some ungodly number of sacks, but they get to the three, and it seemed like Shapin was never comfortable. So I, I thought they did a good job this week of uh, making some pressure happen. And I will say this: he throws for less than fifty percent, and he, he had an interception that got returned for a score, but. Pro- probably because he had a, not a great supporting cast, but I actually thought Blake Shapen looked pretty good besides the stupid throw to Garber. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, was that the easiest pick six you've seen since Justin Gardner's against Jalen Daniels? Yeah, I was going to say, the, the, the only other one that can match it is Jalen Daniels, and I think Jalen Daniels was only like 16, 17 years old at the time, so I get it. Yeah, But that one he threw across the field in the Sunflower Showdown to Justin Gardner um, still might be the worst. I was so while I was going through and I was doing research on uh, Will Howard and his touchdown passes to individual players, um, it was funny to go back and look at the box score from that game. I said 55 nothing earlier. I guess it was 55 14. KU did, in fact, score in that game. Um, But if you go through and look, K State (laughs) did not score an offensive touchdown in that game until 52 seconds left in the first half. And they were already up 20 to seven when they scored that touchdown because Phillip Brooks had a punt return, a couple of Blake Lynch field goals, and then Justin Gardner had his pick six. Um, and then in total in that first half, K State scored 34 points and just seven came from the offense because then we know Phillip Brooks had another punt return for a touchdown against KU. So uh, kind of funny to look back and see how that, that played out uh, in that game uh, against uh, KU. So. I don't know, just a little nugget thrown there. Speaking of Will Howard and his touchdown passes, the third over-under was Will Howard, two and a half. You and I both wisely took the over, knowing that there was a record in play and he was going to get to it. I don't know what Drew was thinking, uh, just deciding that they weren't going to let Will get that accolade out of the way this week. He took the under, so that's a loss for him. He uh, got it the first quarter. Go, yeah, <laughs> go any way you want with this on Will Howard getting the all-time touchdown pass record at K-State because I know that there are a lot of people that feel a lot of different ways about uh, him achieving this mark. Also, I think I mentioned it last week, but I'll I'll use it to to kind of just repeat this argument, and I did it on the three-ball post-game show again this week. I don't consider it a career or a lifetime achievement award for Will Howard. He started, what, 25, 26 games? He's doing it in the same amount of games as everyone else at the top of that list, sometimes in some cases less. So – this wasn't just to him about playing a bunch of games. Very few starts. Some of those starts, he's, he leaves the game early, right? Think mm-hmm. about Texas Tech this year. Um, there's some of the games he didn't start, like Baylor last year, where he plays a lot. But at the end of the day, it, it wasn't anything crazy um, in terms of volume, uh, like a lot more volume than everyone else on that list. He's playing just about the same amount, like I said, in some cases less. This is just about him having to s- sustain success, especially after the first year of COVID year where he didn't really do much of anything. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's uh, that's I, I feel the same way. And look, there's really a chance that even this year, uh, if you just take this year and last year, he probably still ends up getting that record because of the pace that he's currently on. I mean, yeah. last season he threw for 15, and this year he's already at 21. He's got three games left. So three there, games left in the se- single season. He's he's going to throw up for more touchdowns 
likely throw for more touchdowns in a single season than any Kansas State quarterback ever. Yep, yep, there's a good chance of it. Uh, we'll see just when it comes. Will it be this week against KU? Will it be next week against Iowa State or uh, in the bowl game whenever? Uh, that... Holmes, his last game at the Bill. Oh, so you're calling it. You're saying he's done after this year at K-State? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, I talked about that last week. I just thought a lot of the things that he said uh, in his press availability last week kind of lends yeah. itself to that. Even if I, – I know there's an opportunity to run it back another year. You got to think – a lot of his best friends are also going to be leaving Ben Sinnott, yeah. Hayden Gillum, you know, that crowd. And two, like, and this is not anything against him, and it's not anything against Avery, so I don't want anyone to think about it that way. But I don't think he wants another year just having to share it or yeah. look over his shoulder. That's tough for a quarterback to do, and it can tell that it wore on him a little bit. Yeah. All right, uh, real quick, here's the, the graphic that I had made. Uh, who stands out to you on this list of guys that have caught touchdown passes from Will Howard in his career, because within this year alone, he has had eight different, like eight new guys catch a touchdown pass from him that had never caught one from him. Uh, but then also Ben Sennett, he didn't catch a touchdown until the Baylor game last year, and he's tied with Philip Brooks for the lead with eight touchdowns. Now, some people didn't like that I split it up by Philip Brooks in the number eight, number eighty-eight. But yes, Philip Brooks caught one as number eighty-eight and seven as number eight. Uh, who who makes uh, some notes on this list? Uh, one of my notes was that Phil Brooks and Ben Sinnott do share the lead tied at eight, so they'll probably battle it out until the end of the year. True. I was a little surprised that Sammy Wheeler was in the top five with three. Sammy wouldn't Seamer. Have, yeah, wouldn't have guessed that one, so good for him. And my third was just the, the amount of tight ends in general. We got Ben Sinnott, <laughs> you got Sammy Wheeler, you got uh, Daniel Matter Bebe, yep. Briley Moore, Will Swanson, Garrett Oakley, and let's throw in Christian Moore. Seven tight ends <laughs> and your 45, I mean, 45 touchdowns, seven different ones. Will Howard loves the tight ends. Yeah, he does. He does indeed love the tight ends. Uh, yeah, it's a, well, I know that another one that kind of stood out to people was that Deuce only caught four of them. Uh, because I think that the obviously everybody remembers the first one, which was against Texas Tech in 2020. It's like 70 yards. They remember yeah. the one in the end zone against Oklahoma State last year. Uh, and so you're thinking, man, if I can think of two right off the bat, like but, why, why weren't there more? But, but Jaron Lewis and Adrian Martinez. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Jaron Lewis has a touchdown pass to Deuce Vaughn. Don't forget that. Um, but yeah, I just, it was kind of cool to look at and think about all those different guys that are on there and, uh, how they've played out and how things have gone for, for K state and Will Howard in his career. And then, yeah, Will Howard has thrown, he's thrown 18, he's thrown 36 touchdown passes in the number 18 jerseys the last two years. So it's, this is not all that much of a lifetime achievement award for him, but no. And maybe that was the secret sauce. Just had yeah. to switch numbers. Yeah, well, that's kind of what everybody was asking last year when they saw that he had switched, so uh, maybe that was the case. All right, rolling on with uh, the over-unders. Keegan Johnson had a big game against Texas, kind of the breakout we were waiting on. Uh, the over-under was set at four and a half. We all took the under on Keegan Johnson, uh, and it ended up working out in our favor. He had three catches. He did get four touches in the game because he got a carry as well. I, um, I will say we got lucky on this one because he got eight targets. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, there were some moments, you know, like he and Jace Brown have had a pretty good stretch here the last couple of weeks, and they both had some moments in the game where I thought, eh, would have liked to have seen him get that, or the opportunity was there and they didn't. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, he comes up just short, and I thought it was a fine game for him. I think it's good just to see that he was getting those targets and that he was also making some plays when he actually got the opportunity and that K-State's getting him involved. I think that's a really big thing as they continue on this season because obviously in the first two losses of the year, that's what was missing for K-State. They didn't have anybody uh, that was a wide receiver that could make plays for them. Now they have guys making plays, added guys like Keegan Johnson and Jace Brown. And Phillip Brooks, since the Texas Tech game, like I will never forget, we talked about in the middle of that week, like Phillip Brooks is not going up to get a football for it. He has never done that in his life. He did it against Texas Tech, and ever since that point, Phillip Brooks has been on a tear and has been really, really good for K-State. Yeah, I, I, I still feel good about Keegan Johnson going back to that. Like, you know, the stats don't sound 
two uh, explosive there, three catches, 31 yards. But I really felt like he still carried his momentum through, did enough in that game, also had five other targets that you still feel like he's heading in the right direction. Uh, the last one, Baylor third down conversion percentage, 32%. I think you summed it up best when you were predicting. You said, I'm not sure much works for Baylor and K-State has been even better defensively at home. Uh, you were right. Not much worked for Baylor uh, over the course of this game. Uh, Baylor was held to 4 of 17 on third down in this game, so under 25%. However, Baylor was 4 of 8 on fourth downs in the game. So uh, that's, they how, did, that's how they play. Yep. Yep, they, did, they did get some of those fourth downs at various points. Uh, what did you make of the K-State overall defensive effort against Baylor? Because obviously they scored two touchdowns from the defensive unit. And uh, they were able to to build a massive lead early and let the offense kind of uh, get after it. Uh, typical defense, you give up that first quarter, then you settle in and play pretty well throughout the game. Interestingly enough, and I, I guess it's because he almost played the entire game, I wouldn't have thought that Blake Schaefer threw four touchdowns, but he did. Yeah. No, yeah, he <laughs> – they made sure to give him his dues. Some people were like, why did they let Blake Shapen stay in there that long? I, I really think that it was like Dave Aranda's just, hey, man, thanks for all you're doing. Like, go out there and get, get yours. Get your numbers. See what happens. Because that's kind of what the Blake Shapen season has been like. It's not his fault that they are losing games. He's not been overwhelmingly good, though, but he's getting the opportunity to go out and do some things in those games. But, yeah, four touchdown passes. Uh, good for Blake Shapen and being able to achieve that. All right, uh, rolling on here. Here is a look at the Big 12 scores from the past weekend. Uh, K-State, their win against Baylor stands out. Also blowouts from Oklahoma and UCF and Iowa State. Uh, what was the most notable score from the weekend for you in the Big 12? We had this conversation, so I wouldn't say we're shocked that Oklahoma State lost because everyone felt like that game was going to be tight. It was the manner in which they lost. They lost – at UCF, a team with I think only had one Big 12 win going into that game, 45 to three. Um, yeah, the the result not a stunner. The margin of victory there a stunner. Yeah, no, no doubt about that one. I couldn't believe it was that bad. Uh, but I think for Oklahoma State, the 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 margin of error for them is razor thin. They're not really built to be a team that can come back either, because then you have to rely on the quarterback. I think the thing that they've done so well once they officially settled on Alan Bowman this year is they've made things really, really easy for him. And obviously it helps when you have Ollie Gordon going off. Ollie Gordon was banged up. He was contained all game by UCF, and uh, it didn't work out for them there. So uh, pretty big. And then also, I guess, notable that KU lost by a field goal at home to Texas Tech. Who all, of, who all of a sudden we thought Tech was not going to go to a bowl game. Now they you know, almost no choice but for them to go to a bowl game. Yeah, a bad, bad loss by KU. Uh, now, I, they, they're, like we said with Tech, they're getting some bad luck here at the quarterback position. But you, that, that's a game that at least at home you got to take care of, especially when you're, you know, you can still squint and have, you know, a chance at the Big 12 title yourselves. And yeah. and you kind of lay a dud there. That's not a, not an ideal loss. And, and you know, I gave Joey McGuire a lot of grief this year too uh, in the way that he's coached. And I don't think he's had a good year at the helm there, but uh, I credit to him for having his guys still up enough to go and win in Lawrence. Yeah. I, I will say that there's maybe a little bit of, um, like you think about K-State in 2021, that they had a, you know, this was still bad Will Howard, but they had a they had to play two games without Skylar Thompson uh, that probably would have been winnable regardless, Oklahoma State and Texas that year. And they were still seven and five despite those losses. Um, I think that there's a little bit of that to this season for KU where at the end of the day, no matter how they finish this season, they're probably going to be better than what their record states just because, like you said, the quarterback luck has not played out in their favor and the timing of it hasn't worked out either. I mean, you think about like the, the first time Jalen Daniels missed, not the opener, but like before the Texas game, felt like that was sprung out of nowhere on them. And so it was like, and I mean, they acted like, hey, yeah, Jason Bean has to just, you know, go out there. He learned it five minutes ago that he's starting today. It's a tough situation to be in on the road at Texas. And then the same type of thing last week where you're having to run Cole Ballard out there against Texas Tech, who when their offense is not screwing them over, the defense can be pretty strong at times for Texas Tech and make things tough. 
And uh, I think KU found that out over the weekend. So that was uh, unfortunate timing for them, which is a good way to lead into uh, a quick little look and preview at what is to come this week for the Sunflower Showdown. Six o'clock kick on FS1, uh, same time slot that K-State and KU got last year, night game in Manhattan, now a night game in Lawrence. Uh, Early in the week, what is your takeaway and thought on Kansas for K-State? The quarterback position's interesting. You know, who's going to play for Kansas? Doesn't sound like Jalen Daniels is even being considered. Um, I doubt that's a cloak and dagger situation. He's probably just not going to be available. He hasn't been practicing. He hasn't been in uniform. Um, Sorry for at least entertaining the idea that he might play a fourth game and still redshirt, but um, I guess I rattled the cages on that one. But it doesn't look like that's going to be in the cards. Is Jason Bean going to be available? Lance Leipold, you know, just had his press conference here on Monday. Sounds like he's at least playing it up. Now, is he being, you know, devious about it? I don't know. He doesn't seem like a guy that would really go to those lengths, but he said he was very optimistic. So yeah, uh, that's good for Kansas because I I just don't foresee a scenario where they can, you know, beat a team like Kansas State with a freshman walk-on at quarterback. I, I don't know that that – they can do that. They can beat Kansas State with Jason being a quarterback, though. Um, the only the only thing you would worry about if you're a Jayhawk fan would be Jason Bean in late game moments. Still not that guy. Um, so, you know, assuming Jason Bean's the guy, I think it's going to be a dogfight for Kansas State. Yeah, I mean, I we we we've known for the last two years now that Jason. There's not a, a ton of difference overall between Jalen Daniels and Jason Bean when KU's playing a football game that they can be equally as good with either of those guys it's like you said it's those late game moments that kind of made the difference where Jason Bean had struggled to finish some things that Jalen Daniels just wouldn't make that bad of a mistake uh and I do think that there's a little there's obviously a little bit more to Jalen Daniels game where he could make some plays happen that Jason Bean can't I think Jason Bean he can make it if you have the situation right for him We'll see. Uh, I mean, there are also some other injuries that I know that KU is having to track after last week's game that can kind of uh, change the way that their their offense might be viewed. Because um, they said, I know that Leipold said today that uh, it's a wait and see situation with Luke Grimm, one of their leading receivers. He also did not practice on Sunday, but Leipold said, "Hey, there's optimism there too that he is able to go similar to Jason Bean," um, and then also. Um, I know that that Mason Fairchild had uh, a little bit of a scary moment. I don't know what the status on him ends up being. So uh, there is a chance that that KU is a little bit banged up in one way or the other. I think we said it over the weekend. Just the, it, that's the wrong kind of game that you want to play before this game if you're KU, where you had a just scratch and claw the entire game. Weather wasn't good. Your injury situation doesn't help you out in any fashion. Uh, now you got to get ready for what's the biggest game of your season. So uh, I, I think they're in a tough spot, but I do think that like people have to be ready because they still have Devin Neal and Daniel Hyshaw. They still have Andy Kotelnicki as their offensive coordinator. This is a legit team, and I think it's still very tough for not just K-State, but anybody in the Big 12 or around the country to reason with themselves like, this is not Kansas football over the last decade. This is a totally different beast. This is a legit college football team that you're playing. Now. I mean, a team that even with the loss is probably still going to be in the top 25 when it comes out tomorrow night. So I think that's tough for people to, to kind of grasp. Like I'm sure that Oklahoma state had a tough time dealing with it last year. I'm sure that, well, we know Texas has had a tough time dealing with it, but Texas also lost the dog crap KU, uh, not just like KU on the, on the rise with Lance Leipold. Um, then Oklahoma this year, I'm sure that they went through it and had a tough time understanding it. I mean, I, I know Illinois, and Illinois is not like the the bell of the ball when it comes to college football, but even they were sitting around like, man, I know this team's improved, but we lost to Kansas in football. It just doesn't feel right. And I think so there are still some moments where people will not give enough credence that they should to Kansas. I mean, this is – honestly, I, I still kind of believe that this is – the the third best team K-State's playing this year. I think Oklahoma State kind of caught lightning in a bottle, but I think KU is is probably overall, they would scare me more than what Oklahoma State would, uh, even if they played to, 
played today against Oklahoma State, that being K-State. So this is a this is a scary team, and K-State's going to have to be ready, but I imagine they will be given the fact that Chris Kleiman has – maybe he's dropped a beat in special teams since Bill Snyder left, but the one area that uh, things have stayed the same from Snyder to Kleiman is that uh, the, the emphasis on beating the heck out of KU has kind of continued, and I imagine that continues this weekend. And uh, it'll just be up to how KU plays to see if it's a close game or not. Yeah, and I'm actually su- supporting Chris Klein today. Got his got his alma mater mm-hmm. on the shirt there, Northern Iowa. Get the Panthers. Uh, great coaching job by Chris Klein last week to really have Kansas State ready after the heartbreaking defeat to Texas. Look, Lance Leipold's a hell of a coach. Uh, Kansas is a top 20 team. Um, but before last week, and they were deserving of it. Should have been in the top 20. And to think how quickly he got them there from the depths that they had fallen, yeah. even deeper with Les Miles, who was a complete disaster, uh, is impressive. Lance Leipold is, you know, people I hate what I say is I think he's one of the top 10 or 15 coaches in all college football. And the Jayhawks are lucky to have him. They're probably going to hold on, try to hold on to him for dear life after this season because there's going to be some suitors that really want to entertain him and hope to take him their way. Um, at the end of the day, KU will have to pay up for him. If they do, maybe they keep him. Uh, it's going to be a tough game. Uh, Jason Bean, like I said, late game moments makes you scratch your head a little bit. But at the end of the day, they're good enough as long as he's available at quarterback to win this game. Kansas State gets up for this game. <laughs> gets up for this game. Not going to have to worry about that. But KU is going to play their tails off too. Like they want this game more than they ever have, probably in the last twenty years. And some of that is because they know they're also good enough to win this game now. Uh, and they haven't been in the last, you know, however many years. So that, that's the way I kind of feel about it. But it's going to, I think it's going to be tight. Things going to be a hell of a game. Uh, people are going to be on the edge of their seat. They'll be very nervous. But, and I'm not saying to like prepare yourself for a loss. I'm not trying to say that. But, you know, if one were to happen, you have to remember this isn't like the KU teams of old that were lucky to win a game. This is a KU team that's in the top five of the Big 12, probably the third or fourth best team the Kansas Kansas State's played this year, and they're top 20 in, for a reason. Uh, so we'll see how it shakes out. Talk about the Kansas injuries. K- Kansas State, you know, has had a fairly healthy year, um, all things considered, especially compared to a lot, what a lot of other teams have endured. Um, but Snake bit a little bit at the linebacker spot, and, and they're probably going to be yeah. without Jake Clifton. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's a that's a good point. They've had uh, certainly their struggles there at linebacker, staying healthy, and we'll see how that goes. And you're facing a team that can run the ball, so you'd like to have as much help as you can uh, up front and in the middle of the defense there. So it uh, could be a big week to see how guys step up. I will say one guy we should probably mention is Rex Van Wy. No fear of losing the red shirt. Now he can play out the rest of the season. He had a pretty good game on Saturday. And he seems like a candidate that he's going to go from obviously not playing in any game this year, except for, I think, the TCU game he appeared in. Uh, Now, I bet it feels like we might see a pretty substantial role from him the rest of the season based on how he played against Baylor. Yeah, perhaps uh, a little added depth there if they want to move Austin Moore to the inside linebacker spot. If if Austin Romain needs spelled or is struggling a little bit and Bo Palmer's not up to the task. Uh, so it'll kind of depend on, on those because I think Austin Romain will probably be the one that's the most affected and gets the most playing time in the absence of Jake Clifton. Uh, Rex Van Wy certainly coming along. It seems like he's that next linebacker that's going to go from, uh, I don't want to say afterthought because it's his first year in Manhattan, but someone that wasn't really at the forefront of folks' minds. And also next year could be like a very significant contributor and, uh, you know, a, perhaps a starter, perhaps one of the best players on the defense, kind of that quick ascension, here I am, um, arrival that we saw from Desmond Purnell must have been the same way. Yeah. We'll have to uh, watch it all. We will have more of our coverage leading up to the game with Kansas and K-State this weekend. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be back on Wednesday. Recap of the Climb and Press Conference, a few more notes, and then also a Thursday night, Friday morning, the game preview will be here. And then Saturday – It will be game day. K-State looking to get their 15th straight win over Kansas. Look, in my lifetime, K-State's only lost four times to KU. And uh, I cannot have my daughter starting out her life with a loss to KU on her resume. 
Uh, we yep. might send her back if that happens. So that's why that's why I'm going to be supporting climbing all week. I got the Northern Iowa shirt. I got a North Dakota State shirt. Uh, we'll put on put that baby on later in the week too. Probably um, got to have all the good juju that that we can. Cats play South Dakota State tonight. If you're listening to this on Monday, uh, so there's more basketball on the way. We'll probably end up doing some kind of show there. Maybe recap that game and what we saw in at least look ahead because I think the next bout would yeah. be the Thanksgiving tournament in the Bahamas where they're playing Providence and then either Georgia or Miami. So um, we'll, we're going to see what Kansas State's made of pretty soon. Yeah, no, K-State basketball uh, not not getting a ton of time to kind of ease themselves into things. There's uh, a little bit of a quick turnaround against South Dakota State who was Summit picked League to win team. the Summit League. Uh, you got to watch out because uh, Zeke, Zeke yeah. Mayo, <laughs> he's had a, a hot start to the season. Uh, for you're uh, kind of dude team. too. You're kind of dude too. Yeah, other he than the fact that he's from, other than the fact that he's from Lawrence, uh, yeah, he is my kind of dude. I mean, Jack he, and threes. <laughs> yes, yeah, he's taking almost ten threes a game this season for South Dakota State, he's making a lot of them. And uh, he had had twenty eight points in both of their first two games. So yeah, I'm team, uh, I'm I'm lightly worried about him. And the team they lost to, by the way, for folks who are like, oh, they lost to Akron. Akron picked to win the MAC. Good for them. Well, I we look uh, give them some respect, but we should not be like, hey, you know, a loss to them to the preseason MAC champ. That's no, that's I, no, no. K State should not I, be in that position. That, this is yeah, not how I, we should be discussing this. Bold prediction here: South Dakota State's going to win an NCAA tournament game, so I don't think they're playing anybody here that they would. They're going to be tested. I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree, and I, I don't necessarily know that it's going to be South Dakota State's doing. I think K-State might test themselves in some way, so uh, we'll have to wait and see. I, I feel a lot better if this game was played in February, I'll say that. Yeah, I, I'll probably feel that way for a while about this K-State team. We'll see uh, how it goes. But yeah, uh, after this one, get this win, you get a handful of days, you head to the Bahamas, and then you get set for uh, a couple of biggies against Providence right. and possibly Nigel Pack. And by the way, Providence is one of the best players in the country as well, Bryce Hopkins. Yeah, that's true. And uh, we got to see him in Greensboro last year. Kentucky yeah, they got, they got the early scout. That. Got the early scout on on Providence and Greensboro last year because they probably did scout him because it was going to be Providence yeah. or Kentucky. Providence has a new coach, so they don't have that benefit. Yeah, Kim English, <laughs> former Missouri Tiger. So a uh, couple of reasons to beat Providence on Friday outside of just not wanting to lose a game. But – that will do it for us. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Stay locked in with everything else we got going on over at K-State Online. Uh, get signed up because that's where all the Cats fans are and apparently some Jayhawks too. So we will uh, keep you up to speed with everything K-State as we continue through Sunflower Showdown Week and a, a busy week of hoops with three games over the next seven days for K-State.